the newsroom. Lots going on this Monday. Later, we'll be digesting news of that weekend nuclear deal with Iran in Geneva. First, though, it's International Violence Against Women Day, a chance for the France 24 debate to take a snapshot of the situation around the globe. Um, it's no given that the situation is improving everywhere. Just one example, a draft of Afghanistan's new penal code would reintroduce public stonings as a means of punishment for adultery. We're going to see where inroads have been made and see with our panel how helping change the way men perceive themselves can be part of the answer. Uh, with us from Kampala in Uganda, Sheila Muwanka, she's executive director of the Foundation for Human Rights Initiative and vice president of the FIDH, the International Federation of Human Rights. Thanks for being with us. Here in the studio, here in the studio Jane Friedman, who works on uh, gender equality at uh, the UN's Education, Science and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. And we'll be joined in a moment uh, by Anne-Cécile Belfer of uh, the uh, French uh, women's rights group Oser le Féminisme, the France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag F24Debate. According to the United Nations, up to 70% of women on the planet confronted by physical or sexual violence during their lifetime, mostly in intimate relationships implicating spouses and partners. There you see 80% of human trafficking victims are female. More than 130 million have, uh, women have undergone female genital mutilation. And the, the United States, they've put a price tag on it. $5.8 billion a year. That's just in the U.S. alone for, for partner violence. These statistics are served up uh, by the United Nations. Um, Sheila Mwanga, let me, let me begin with you. Um, when you look at how things have evolved in your country uh, in terms of violence against women since you uh, left university and started working on this as a social worker, and, um, would you say that the, the situation is improving, women are coming forth and reporting violence more, or is there still a long way to go? Um, thank you very much. Um, I think there's still a long way to go. There have been some um, progress in certain areas, um, but there's also, um, there's still a lot of challenges in, in other areas. Now, you work, um, you, you, you work Sheila, with... Um, uh, as well with an organization called Come Let's Talk, which uh, provides sort of support, right, to, to, to women and children. Is that something that's easy to do? It's, it's not easy to do. Um, it, it's, it's, um, a diffi it's difficult because sometimes you get caught up with the, 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 emotional, the emotional challenges that these women and those people who have been abused um, go through. Sometimes separating yourself from the pain can be very difficult. Sometimes separating yourself from the first frustration of seeking justice can also be very difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. Would you say that uh, overall the courts uh, in Uganda are prosecuting more diligently cases of uh, domestic violence, violence against women? No. First of all, just getting um, um, victims or you know, survivors to report um, cases to the police is, is a challenge. Because of the stigma attached to it, because of the fear of being isolated, but also because of poverty. Because deciding to take a case to uh, pressing charges against your uh, abuser or suspect abuser, you need to All right, we seem to have uh, lost the uh, the audio connection there. Hopefully, we'll we'll, we'll have that 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 sorted out uh, in a moment. Um, one issue um, uh, that's been another issue that's been in the news we've been talking about uh, out of India, so-called Arab kalyanams or short-term weddings. Officials at a home for underprivileged girls in Kerala accused of marrying off a 17-year-old to a citizen of the United Arab Emirates back in June. Several weeks later, uh, came the divorce. The first time I saw him was in the orphanage. They presented all the girls to him one by one, and he chose me. After that, I was told that he would be my husband. 
and the wedding would have to take place within a week. Jane Friedman, these short-term marriages, how much of an, uh, of an issue? We know that in Tunisia it's been in the news as well. This is something that's not just, of course, in India. No, I think it's not just in India. It's a global problem. It's uh, short-term marriages, also problem of um, underage marriage, young girls who are getting married at very, very young ages. Um, and it's related to women's economic condition, um, also their legal status, their dependence on their on their husband, their fathers, who in, and then in turn dependence on husbands. So um, it's a, really a global problem. And uh, this issue, the, the, in this particular instance, a, a girl in, an, in, a, in a, uh, a shelter in India who's then whisked away to the United Arab Emirates, globalization brings its, its own set of problems. It does. I mean, the problems have always existed, but with globalization, we see a lot more movement of people across borders and women um, can be particularly vulnerable, particularly when they're uh, situations of poverty and situations of, of dependence. Um, and there's clearly there's the, this kind of case, there are problems of trafficking, um, where women and children are the principal victims of trafficking, and also problems of uh, Domestic workers, for example, there's a huge movement of domestic workers who, again, often find themselves very isolated in uh, vulnerable situations, dependent on their employer and can be easily be victims of violence. So globalization and the movement of uh, people around the globe much more actually can increase the vulnerability um, to violence. Uh, increase the vulnerability. And Cécile Melfer, welcome to the, to, to, to the panel. Um, when you look at these, the movement of people. I know, for instance, we talked there in, in the statistics at the top about female, female genital mutilation. And um, people are saying that the French have been more aggressive in prosecuting it than the British, for instance. Is, is female genital mutilation, for instance, again, this issue of globalization, because it, 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 it's now become an issue here in France. Yes, it is. And um, I knew that the government has act uh, regarding this a few months ago. Uh, but still, there is around, I think it's around 50,000 cases of uh, uh, women or, and girls here in France that are victim of uh, genital mutilations. Um, so, so, of course, yes, uh, we, are, we live in a globalized world. So genital mutilation, prostitution, uh, forced marriage, all these are, uh, we, here in France, we are also, we have also cases of women victims of all that, yes. All right, and and um, uh, the um, you look at the today we've been sifting through all the all the data, looking at the reports. Do you get the sense that things are improving or not? Because well, it's it makes obviously for a lot of depressing reading. <clears throat> yes, <laughs> it is uh, it is depressing to see in countries like France that uh, between two thousand eleven, for instance, and two thousand twelve, there has been an increase of twenty two percent of women who died. Uh, because of uh, male partner or former male partner. So now we have in 2012, 178 women who died because of domestic male violence. So Why do uh, you think it's on the rise? Uh, pr a lot of different factors. Uh, probably uh, we all know that when there is an economical crisis, it's always one of the consequences is that uh, violences against women are increasing. Uh, but to, uh, apart from that, we live. We still live in a world where uh, there is a lot of male violence because we still li live in a world and in a country in France where there are inequalities. And we have to understand sexual violences and violences against women in general as the source and the consequences of male domination. Uh, it is directly linked. It is a way to... It is a a crucial social factor that explains uh, the fact that women are still subordinate uh, to men in, in, in all the areas uh, of life. When we see the figures in France, it's just tremendous. Uh, there is, for instance, uh, when women um, speak about it, they say that we say that one out of 10 women su have suffered in their lifetime of domestic, any form of uh, domestic violence. Uh, well, so uh, one out of five suffered from uh, rape or sexual harassment or any type of sexual and, violence. And how reliable 
are those statistics? Because we know how underreported uh, incidents of... Uh, yes. So, for instance, when we say that still today in France, there are 75,000 women that are raped, uh, this, is, this does not mean that they are all reported. Mm. But this is an estimation based on uh, calls to the um, centers like... Um, Francis Disney for one three one three six one nine. It's a hotline, yeah, for uh, for uh, for domestic violence and, and violence against women in general. So it's on association reports from the police, of course, but also association and estimation. And so seventy five thousand rapes every year, and we're only talking about women, so uh, from eighteen years old. So we see that it's still tremendous and we have to act because it's just not normal that in a country like France, uh, there is still such a high level of violence and we need to act and to tackle really uh, male domination. All right. Uh, the, uh, the, on Twitter, we have a, re a response from that. Those that commit violence against women are our kids from our families educated in our schools. So obviously... Uh, person who's, who's who's sending that feels agrees with you it's not something from the other part of the far-flung other part of the world it's it's not from the other part of the world and also it's not committed by um like some um, anonymous psychopath that i mean sometimes it does but most generally what happens is that 80 percent of the cases are from somebody from a man that is known by the victim so we always see that it's like uh, a sum of very uh, particular cases, but it's not that. It's really a general, uh, it's a system, and it's most of the time by men that we think they're just, they can be your colleague, they can be your father, they can be your cousin, your uncle. Uh, they really, they can be anybody. And um, and this is also, this explains why it's so hard for the victim to, to testify. And Cecilia is saying that economic hard times, obviously a, a big factor in all of this. Um, is the trend that she's mentioning the same the world over? Yes, global trends show that there are very, very high levels of violence against women which are persisting. It's difficult to say how much they're increasing because, as you said, statistics are very unreliable. A lot of cases of violence against women just go unreported. But the World Health Organization released um, statistics which show globally um, that about 70% of women will be victims of violence and one in three women will be victims of violence from their partner, their husband or their partner. So globally, the statistics show that there are, you know, the levels of violence remain high. And that's despite international conventions, legislation. There's, there has been action but globally, but it's just not having an impact on violence. And I think um, what, what was said is true, that it's... Violence is a product of fundamental gender inequalities and of gender norms which teach men and women how to behave in a certain way and what is normal and what's normal behaviour. And we have to change that. We have to go back to, you know, look at socialisation, look at education uh, to change those fundamental gender inequalities. Uh, on that point, and I, I'll put this to you, Sheila Mwanga, um, there's uh, uh, from the World Bank, Maria Correa, who's put out... Um, um, who wrote a column that was published um, uh, today saying, uh, we need to redefine notions of manhood and find alternatives to masculine identities that are not destructive to men and women alike. Essentially, um, that we need to uh, raise boys better. Um, is that something that's talked about in Uganda? Sorry? Is that something that's talked about in Uganda, how to... Uh, uh, what the role models should be for boys that are growing into men? Yes, that, that's, that's one of the strategies that actually has been adopted in Uganda. Um, one of the things that um, parents, role models are, are asking um, um, all those who are taking care of um, children, especially the boys, is to, 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 to bring a new picture to... Um, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a boy, and that violence does not mean masculine. And on the contrary, actually, protection and love mean masculine. So those are the messages that are, are, are coming really across, um, especially in schools and um, in homes. Uh, is, it, is it a hard message to get across when you're dealing with a country 
like Uganda, where you have a rural-based population that's moving into the cities, people already feeling uprooted, and there you're asking them to change the way they look at their household effectively. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, the, 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 the belief and, and, and the ge um, genderization is, is very strong. People have been brought up, you know, to feel like, to, 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 to believe that when you're a man, you take control of your family and your property. And a woman, for example, is part of your property. And therefore, you, it, your sense of protection or your meaning of protection sometimes is translated into, you know, violence. Show them you have the power. Show them you're in control. They will not speak or they will speak um, less. So it's 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 a difficult business, and it's not only you know within the rural populations. I mean, we have seen, for example, when we when there's been discussion and debate around um, some of those um, pieces of legislation that we think would promote um, women's rights, but would also ensure protection from violence. We have seen that even sometimes our members of parliament have been caught up, you know, in, in that culture, and therefore defend that masculinity because of the gender, the gender roles, because of the genderization, really. So it's not really only in the rural community. All right, so uh, me members of parliament, 80% of violence is com uh, against women committed by someone the victim knows. That's a comment from uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the viewers there who's watching. Members of parliament being sexist, that is, um, of course, something that's been topical here in France, what there was a, uh, in this case, I suppose on the face of it harmless, a man who cackled when a female member of parliament was uh, making a speech and that created a big storm. Do you think France is changing in that respect that things like this, people are not getting away with it anymore? Um, France is changing, however, not as fast as we can, as we wished. Um, what we saw with that, with what happened in national assembly is that um, for the first time, women, uh, member of parliament reacted and they reacted together and that was really um, impressive and, and really beautiful to see that, you know, they said, like, stop, you cannot do that. And they were able to do that because now in the parliament there is 27% of women, which is, okay, really not a lot. It used to be 18%. <laughs> it used to <laughs> but be a lot it used lower. to be uh, much yeah. less. And so because they are, there is a higher number of women, now they can organize and react and now it's harder for men to, uh, to impose their domination over there. All right. That's where we'll leave it for now on that, I guess, positive note. And Cécile Melfer, <laughs> I want to thank you. I want to thank Jane Friedman. I also want to thank uh, Sheila Mwanka for joining us from Kampala. Stay with us here in the France 24 debate. Part two of our discussion is going to turn our attention to what could be a seminal moment for the Middle East and Iran.